So for this chapter, we're going to talk about the art of the Dutch Republic. And we're looking at the 17th century, so from 1600 to 1700. And we'll talk a little bit about picturing civic culture and a group portrait that we'll look at, I think, first. And then a little bit about etching and dry point, a little bit about genre painting, a little bit about still life, and the world depicted. We'll look at some very scientific studies of the natural world, or a one painting. So the Dutch Republic was formed in 1581 and governed mostly by elected citizens rather than a powerful person from the church or a powerful member of the aristocracy. Um, so much like our own system where we elect officials. Um, it was very religious tolerant, which is important because remember this is the time of the Reformation uh, where the Protestants and the Catholics are fighting each other. And so this was a place they could both coexist. It was a trade-based economy, um, and they were actually quite prosperous. The Dutch artists catered largely to Protestants, uh, so a lot of Protestants were there. And so because Protestants tend to avoid uh, kind of dramatic religious imagery, there were portraits, genre scenes, still lifes, and landscapes. And so it was commercial sales and direct commissions that were funding these artworks rather than the aristocracy or the church. And there was a sensitivity to the Protestant suspicion, wariness of luxury and sensuality. So here is a map of the trade routes uh, the Dutch had with different ports and colonies. And you can see it's quite extensive, stretching all the way to the Americas, up into um, Amsterdam, into Africa, and into parts of Asia. So we're going to look at a painting, um, and just to kind of introduce it, it is a painting of officers and civic guards um, who were usually wealthy, and those posts were often a step towards getting a position in the government. Um, belonging to a militia, a group like this, conferred status, and group portraits were popular. Each member would pay for his inclusion in the picture, so if you didn't pay, you would not be included, um, and the pictures were often hung in the halls of the civic guards. Dutch group portraits generally don't document a specific event, rather they function as a series of individual portraits brought together in an imagined composition by the artist. So let's take a look. Um, so here we have Franz Hall's Banquet of the Officers of St. Hadrian's Civic Guard. And you can see exactly what we were talking about, how it seems to be more a composition of individual portraits than a group portrait. And what do I mean by that? They're not all um, posed together, standing, um, looking out at the artist. They're turned in different directions. Some people are not even looking directly at us. Um, there's a dynamic sense of movement, uh, which is really sort of underscored by this dramatic, by the dramatic um, diagonal here. Um, and um, there is a sense of the drama with a dynamic kind of composition um, that we would consider Baroque. Um, some of the hallmarks of Hall style, Franz Hall, would include um, loose brushwork, dynamic composition, and the ability to reveal the character of his city, sitters. So if you look closely at each sitter, um, you notice they have separate personalities and ways of interacting. The compositional lines, the diagonals that I was showing you, create drama and stability both. And the positioning of the figures around the table solves the Last Supper problem. So what does that mean? So remember, like for the Last Supper, it's like Da Vinci's. We see the long table, and then the 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 disciples and Christ all on one side of the table, which would have to be really long. Um, and here we see that Halls has arranged his figures in a dynamic way around the table. Uh, without resorting to putting them in all one direction on one side of the table. 
So Rembrandt van Rijn is a really important artist. Most of you have probably heard of Rembrandt. Um, he was extremely um, ambitious in art and made many, 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 many paintings and prints. Um, this is a painting called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nikolaus Tulp. And you can see um, the kind of Baroque drama of the faces that are like hovering over this dead body that's lit. Um, and you see the gory kind of red here where the muscles and ligaments are being shown. Um, and this student here who's taking notes. Um, and you can see this is, of course, the one, the doctor who's leading the proceedings. Um, it's fun to know um, back then that they were not using uh, medical gloves yet. They were still using bare hands. Um, medical gloves were something that would come to the future. Um, so again, we're talking about Baroque qualities of realism, intimacy, dramatic lighting, and composition to a group portrait format. This attention uh, we see in the composition with the doctor and the patient um, and the attention to eyes and hands in the painting, um, it's suggested by the text that this um, connects it to the art and medicine um, part of the scientific revolution. Um, so a big change happening there where science is becoming more and more dominant. And the two men gazing at us draw us into the painting, which is sort of an important compositional device. And here is one of Rembrandt's great prints. Um, in fact, it's called the 100 Gilder print because that's how much he got paid for it, which was quite a bit of money at that time for a print. Um, but of course, it's Christ healing the sick which is in parentheses. So again, a very Baroque and a dramatic lighting uh, against this darkness and sort of these dynamically placed individuals and these groupings. Um, it's engraving and dry point on Japanese paper. So they've been trading with Japan and they have paper from Japan. And something like this would have uh, been bought for the home um, as a means of facilitating pious living. Um, and it actually combines different events from the Gospel of Matthew. So really kind of telling different stories from Matthew in a single print. Um, this word here, chiaroscuro, um, just means this sort of heightened use of um, light and dark um, is what that is referring to, the kind of shading. And this is um, in your text online, um, just to show you how etching works. So we have the plate being covered with a waxy, acid-resistant resin, and then the artist draws the design, and then it's submerged in acid. And um, then once the acid etching is complete, the resin is removed, and then the plate is inked and run through a machine like this that would press the paper against the plate. Um, and then the image is complete. So for all of you printmakers out there, uh, you might recognize parts of this process from your own work. Um, and then this is dry point, and it's just kind of showing you um, how kind of ragged the edge from dry point is. Uh, it's kind of like a fuzzier, more velvety line when inked. Here's another painting by Rembrandt. Rembrandt is infamous for his self-portraits. He, um, he created so many during his lifetime at all different stages and ages. Um, so here we have self-portrait with two circles. There's a little bit of debate about what these two circles could mean. Are they a map on the wall of the globe or are they a suggestion about mathematic um, sort of focus or you know is it that thing where if you're a, a skilled artist you can draw a perfect circle well the circle is not perfect so it's probably not that one but anyway that's a detail let's look at the painting so we see his face is again dramatically lit he's looking at us in a very humble sort of manner of fact way um there are times when rembrandt um 
portrays himself as very wealthy and witty and um, here it's a quieter portrait it's an intimate portrait of him sort of looking at us with the painting tools in his hands hand um, so this is one of at least 80 self portraits that Rembrandt painted and together they chronicle the artist's early artistic ambition the confidence of his middle life success and then the personal tragedies of his later life, including poverty. Um, the sketchy, unfinished quality of the brushstroke um, creates a sense of intimacy with the viewer. And like I was saying, those two circles can be um, interpreted different ways. I brought this in um, on my own. This is the turn of the Repodical Sun. I just think it's an especially beautiful Rembrandt. Um, we have these rich reds and the dramatically lit father um, welcoming, welcoming the prodigal son home. Um, and the older brother's face is lit. Um, it's a long story, um, but basically uh, the son says, I want my inheritance now, which basically is like saying, I wish you were dead. He goes out, he squanders it, decides that maybe he could be a servant at his dad's house, um, his father's house, and so he returns and his father is waiting down the road and embraces him and welcomes him back into the family, not as a servant, but as a son. So just a really beautiful, uh, kind of expressive um, look, I mean, just look at the beauty of the shaved head um, that is pressed into the father's chest, it's just a beautiful painting. So we're going to switch now to genre painting. Genre just means everyday subjects. Um, so sometimes it can be a domestic scene, um, it can be a market scene, anything you might see in kind of a, on a daily basis. Um, here we have this wonderful scene from Judith Le Leister, and yes, she is a woman, and it's called The Young Flute Player. And the thing about the Dutch is a lot of times there is symbolism um, that isn't entirely clear, but suggestive. Um, so there's been a lot written on this painting. For example, on the wall, we see a stringed instrument next to a recorder. Well, a recorder, for those of you who played one as a child, understand, is one of the most modest instruments, while the stringed instrument represents the sort of most important, best instrument. So to have those two hanging together suggests a certain coexistence of the most ordinary, humble instrument and the most kind of valued um, quality instrument. Um, and when we look at the boy, we see some of the same things. His face looks very dignified, but he's playing sort of on a common flute. And there are places where you can see, like here on his elbow, where his clothes need patching and um, he seems to be a, a modest means. Um, so how you interpret that, um, there's a lot of different uh, possibilities. Um, so we talked about everyday scenes being genre paintings. Also, this could be a portrait of the boy or a still life with the instruments. So there's sort of this blurred um, quality to the categories of this painting. Um, so there's these juxtapositions we we're talking about, uh, attention and inattention, loftiness and shabbiness, um, and the depiction of a youth making music could be a reflection on music theory and the exploration of beauty and art. And then um, this particular painting um, may be sort of what we call a moralizing tale. It's by Jan Steen, and it's As the Old Sing, So the Pipe Young, and that's taken from a song. Um, but you can see this sort of uh, revelry um, there, uh, enjoying alcohol, and um, different things are happening. You can see here the the father is allowing his son to smoke his pipe. Um, people are relaxing, drinking, um, and um, there's this exotic parrot. So why the parrot? Um, 
possibly to show that the parrot imitates you, right? The speaker. Um, so maybe the son is going to parrot the father, the one who's allowing him to smoke the pipe. So the message might be, be careful what you do, your children will see you and they might mimic you. Um, but it's sort of funny how some of them are portrayed in having fun. Um, but it's also sympathetic. They don't uh, look um, disrespect, unrespected. Um, but we do see this sort of idea of, you know, will this drunken behavior of the elders of the family um, be imitated by the younger generations? Um, this is a Vermeer. And the thing about a Vermeer is um, in person, a Vermeer is absolutely spectacular. You don't see any loose brush strokes. It's perfectly polished. Um, the sense of light, uh, the luminous quality of his light sources, um, just amazing. Um, so here we have the art of painting. So we actually are looking here just to see a detail that shows um, I, Ver, Mir. Um, so he's signed this painting. Um, but the artist um, creates sort of a discourse by showing himself painting on the nature and status of his own painting practice. Um, and there are some things of symbolism, the muse is um, an allegorical figure and it allows you to not only enjoy the surface of the painting, um, but also um, what it symbolizes. Um, look here, this is a map hung on the wall and the details are phenomenal. Um, and that's part of what makes a Vermeer great. And then um, we're going to talk just for a moment about still lives. Um, like other Dutch art, it is often packed with uh, meaning. Um, so let's look at our first one. This is Clara Peters, another woman, art, woman artist. And one thought is, is that since the art market was commercially driven, that it was easier for women to um, become artists for a career. Um, and this is her still life with cheeses, almonds, and pretzels. Um, so we see, of course, the cheese sitting on, or the butter sitting on the bread, and these very well articulated dishes. And the detail is absolutely stunning. Look at the knife here. Um, so there are some possible interpretations. Oh, but here's a detail. Uh, you can see the reflection of a face here. And look, her name is here, Clara Peters, on that knife. Um, just phenomenal detail. Um, so the Tower of Cheese may actually serve as a moralizing message advocating against gluttony. There was sort of this phrase about the butter on the bread um, and the way it's stacked might kind of refer to this idea. Um, a f uh, interesting observation is that on the left side of the painting, we have domestic Dutch products. Um, and then on the right, we have foreign goods, um, such as that blue and white dish of almonds on the table. Um, and so it kind of shows a tableau of desirable commodities that would have reflected the objects in a wealthy patron's home. Peter Klaus uh, did what we call a vanitas with a violin and a glass bowl. I don't know if any of you have heard of the word vanitas. Um, maybe you've heard of memento mori. Two are very similar. So a vanitas uh, shows um, different objects, but with um, a theme of the fleeting nature of life and the reality of death. Um, and this particular still life, we have an actual skull. Um, we have an instrument with only one string left. Um, we have a glass that's been turned over a walnut that's been peeled and started to rot, a timepiece that's stuck um, and broken, and then um, 
you know, other things. Uh, but here we have this mirror ball. Um, and see this figure here? That's the artist with his easel reflected. So is he reminding himself of the fleeting nature of life? Is this sort of ball, um, would it easily fall off the table? Is it precariously placed? Um, these are all questions you can ask of a painting like this. This is another woman artist, Rachel Roosh, um, flowers in a glass vase. Um, and these were very carefully picked. So um, these flowers would have bloomed at different times. So by bringing them together, it's very kind of artificial. And by showing them sort of past their prime in their bloom, um, it does sort of suggest the fleeting nature of life again. Um, and sometimes the flowers are considered um, symbolic. So, um, they are the most expensive type of still life. So she did really well in her career financially. Um, it's an impossibility, of course, because you can never bring these flowers together and bloom at the same time. And it's symbolic with a range of possibilities um, that we won't fully go into today. And then finally, it's the world depicted. And here we have yet another woman artist, Maria Sibylla Marine, and it's the life cycle of a moth. So she has very carefully observed this in nature and made this very scientifically accurate depiction of the life cycle of a moth. So you can see it in its sort of caterpillar state and eating the leaves and then the cocoon and then the moth state. Um, really quite beautiful. She was an artist and a naturalist, and she spent her life studying the life cycles of insects. Um, some characteristics of her um, unique style um, are documenting the relationship between the insect and its environment. Um, so you see like with the leaves there. And she had uh, influence on generations uh, of botanical and scientific illustrators after her. All right, so that's the end of this chapter. It was a nice short one, and I will see you for Romanticism.